Hey, hey, everyone. Welcome to this week's episode of The Amazon Files, brought to you by Mommy Income. I am Amy Fearman. Kristen won't be joining me. She's off this week because I am bringing on a special guest in just a minute. We all know that the only constant with running any business, including an Amazon business, is change. Amazon is always making changes, little and big, that can impact how we can successfully do business on the platform. Now, one of the areas where change is happening is in the realm of suspensions. What gets Amazon sellers suspended? So we decided to bring on Leslie Hensel from Riverbend Consulting to help talk us through what the top things that are getting Amazon sellers suspended in 2020 so you can protect your business and be prepared, A, if those things happen to you, or B, so they don't have to happen to you at all. So Lizzie was on the podcast back in episode 14. She and her partner, Joe Zolta, have built an agency that focuses on the client first and is building, helping build businesses and reinstate businesses third-party sellers on the Amazon platform. They are third-party sales and compliance experts. What does that mean? That means that they not only help you get reinstated, they know all of Amazon's policies by the back of their hand, even as they're changing, but they also have the ability to help you better manage your Amazon business as a whole. Today, I'm bringing on Leslie to chat with us about the top things that are happening on Amazon in the suspension world, what is getting people suspended and what we can do about it. Now, before I dig into that, I'd like to invite you to bring any of your questions that you have after listening to this over to our Facebook community. We have a growing community of sellers who are looking to help each other continue to grow and get their questions answered. So head over to mommyincome.com with the code word prevent to get into our Facebook community and continue to get your questions answered. So without further ado, Leslie, come on and join me. Let's have a conversation. Thank you so much for having me again. I appreciate it. Now, We haven't had you on the podcast in a couple of years. Can you tell us uh, about Riverbend Consulting and where you've gone since we last talked to you? Absolutely. So when we first talked, we were a brand new baby company, just a few months old and had, I think, all of four employees, which is what we started with. Uh, We specialize in helping people with account suspensions, ASIN suspensions, some account management services. And then um, we started to grow. And I think there's a couple of reasons for that. I'd like to take a little bit of credit because we work hard. But also, you know, Amazon is still doing a lot of enforcement, suspending a lot of accounts. A lot of bigger folks out there really want to have a risk manager on their team, but they don't want to hire a risk manager. So they started hiring us to be their ongoing risk manager. So now we have almost 40 employees and we have six ex-Amazon employees who worked in seller performance, seller account health, and seller support, which is super awesome because I have so much more knowledge now than I ever thought I would intimately of how things have operated in Amazon. Um, you know, our, our, cl- our, sorry, our employees, they are very, very careful because of course they have NDAs they signed with Amazon. So there's a lot of things they can never talk about, but they can explain to me like why a client's FBA inventory disappeared or how we can rewrite a POA so that we can get it through and get a plan accepted by Amazon. It's really great. It's really great to be able to have that asset on your team. Um, This is why it's a benefit to know people like this. So if your account does get suspended, you know where to go and be able to have the, know that they have the resources to help work to get your account reinstated. Well, that's amazing. Now today specifically, I mean, you do this, on a daily basis. Yes. So you're in the weeds with people who've had their accounts suspended. We really want to dig into what are the things that are causing account suspension in 2020 and has it evolved and changed from what it was three years ago? 
It has, and there's a few things that are consistent. Amazon is always going to suspend accounts for inauthentic. Um, they're always going to suspend accounts for review manipulation, but there are certain trends. And sometimes that's because internally at Amazon, they've decided they see some metrics they don't like overall, or they see the catalog is becoming a little more messy. And so they will enforce against certain things. One thing we've seen a lot of in the last few months which is very interesting to me that I don't fully understand, to be honest, is that instead of going after people for inauthentic, they're going after them for use sold as new. So you and I both know that most of the time, it's not actually a used product, um, but someone has written to Amazon, called them, chatted with them, returned the item and chosen from that drop down menu and said, I think this item was actually used. Now there's a few ways that can happen. If you're an FBA seller, um, <laughs> any seller watching this knows that the FBA team doesn't always do a great job with disposition of returns. So they'll put things back in your sellable inventory, they get resold, and then obviously it is used, sold as new. And that's not the seller's fault, but it does happen. Um, which something we should talk about in a few minutes is the settings that they've changed regarding that. But uh, you sold as new is just a really big trend now. And one interesting thing is it's almost exactly like an inauthentic suspension because they still ask you for invoices. They want you to prove that this was new stuff. Another thing that we it's are It's hard to change, try, say that it's new stuff if Amazon put used stuff back on the shelf. I mean, you can prove it originally when you got it, but there's that piece of it that you don't have control over. Absolutely. And they have changed settings. So this is super important. For a while, you could say that you did not want your returns to be repackaged. There's a setting in the account if you sell FBA that says repackage returns and you could enable or disable. They've changed that now. Everyone is required to opt in to repackaging. Now, obviously, this is an issue because they're not always repackaging into the you know, retail store type packaging, they're repackaging your items, sending it out, and someone thinks it's generic. But what you can opt out of, that if you have not done it, like literally go in your account right now and do this in Seller Central under your FBA settings, there is another setting for refurbishment. And you want to disable refurbishment. Refurbishment is horrifying. Refurbishment, it actually says, like for clothing, that Amazon can steam the clothing or take out spots. I mean, seriously? Because that kind of scares me that Amazon would actually... W I'm pretty sure that their <laughs> warehouse staff is not skilled in steaming or spot removal. I know. It's not like they have some staff of 1950s grannies sitting there with a bunch of ironing boards. <laughs> 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 yeah, no, they definitely don't. And th so, and this goes to show that while Amazon thinks it has our best interests in mind to make life easier, it's not always the best bet. I know that, you know, going back to talking about them used, sold as new, how many times, I mean, I've had this happen with bundles where they think all the components are there, but they don't actually check. Right. And so it's missing one or two. And then somebody says, I got this and it was missing X, Y, and Z. And I'm like, well, it wasn't sent in that way. And so it, it's frustration. I know we, we've had it asked so many times in the Facebook community, can we just not have them reshelf returns? Can they send them all back to us so we can make that suggestion, like that delineation for ourselves? Can we choose whether it goes back on the shelf or not? And unfortunately, we don't have that option. Right. And you know, a couple of years ago, they actually announced a pilot program where they were going to ship returns directly back to the seller. And then I don't know if they did the pilot program and it failed. Or if they just never did the pilot program, I don't know which it is, but it has never happened. And I haven't talked to any sellers who were part of it. So um, one thing that we do recommend, this is something I usually recommend to people who sell supplements, but I think it might work for bundles because you might be shipping in a poly bag or in a box is that you can put a seal. So you'd have to have a seal printed that's your own custom seal that you print over the opening so that when someone has opened it, it breaks that seal. And the seal says, if seal is broken, item is not new. And so you're not doing that for your end user, for your buyer. You're doing that so that when it gets back to the Amazon warehouse, they might, they might notice and throw it into your <laughs> They might notice. <laughs> yes. 
they might notice. They they're need 24-inch a- print across the entire edge of the box, I swear. Yes. Um, yeah. But it's at least giving you the option. We've talked about that as Amazon is leading towards custom packaging for brands yes. on Amazon. We are seeing, like, how do we make it? Because it all of a sudden becomes an option. But if your packaging is really expensive, it's really hard to say, oh, that hurts. But it's part of cost of business, right? And so that's, it's interesting to, 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 to see how that impacts. But yeah, if you want to not have the issues with used sold as new, how do, we, how do we combat that? One of it is with packaging. Absolutely. And this, the seal issue, I know it absolutely does help my sellers who sell supplements. Um, they have had dramatic improvements, which as you probably know, supplements are never supposed to be resold. So it baffles me that they are, but putting that seal on there that says a seal is broken item is not new. It does really help. Um, You know, if you, you have to really hope if you're selling something in a poly bag or a box, that's all the components thrown in there, that the the buyer is actually returning it all in that poly bag or box. I wish. uh, Which a lot of times (laughs) they won't do, right? But uh, I mean, it's one of the few things that you can do to protect yourself. It's so true. Um, so we're talking specifically about you sold as new is one of the areas where people are getting caught. What is another area where we're seeing suspensions happening right now? So something very interesting happened at Amazon. Um, there is a particular executive who was out for a while and now he's back. He was on some kind of sabbatical and he is tasked with keeping a clean catalog. And he, that would explain a lot of what's been happening lately. Yes. And he, um, it's very important to him and his job and the people that he oversees that the catalog be clean. And as you know, anyone can add a listing to the catalog. Therefore, it is never clean. Um, so since he is back, we have seen a dramatic rise in the number of warnings for uh, product detail page abuse, variation abuse. Um, any manner of your listing isn't done the way it's supposed to be done and suspensions for those as well. So that's interesting because on the other side, we're seeing the, we're unable to list under GTN exemption anymore without showing branded packaging. And so there's right. this, that's, that's, so we're seeing these cheese coming at it from both sides, the before it gets listed and also the it's listed and not up to par. Um, I still am always amazed at some of the listings that still sit out there and you're just like, how is that listing still allowed to be there? And mine's not. <laughs> Absolutely. And I think a lot of people who are good actors don't even understand the creativity of the bad actors out there. It is crazy the things that people do. But here's the big warning is that then they get themselves on their YouTube channel and tell you how great it is to do these things because it's super good. It's going to get you great sales rank. Don't do it. If it feels like you're circumventing a system, don't do it. Amazon doesn't like circumventing. So I got to tell you one of these circumventing things we've been seeing that actually isn't just a listing violation. Amazon labels it code of conduct. And mm-hmm. if you get code of conduct suspension, it's really hard to come back. So it's about zombie listings. Have you heard of what zombie is listings? A zombie listing? It's a really sexy name for something that's not that exciting. <laughs> So a zombie (laughs) listing is where you find, and there is actually, there are services and software that will do this for you. It's where they find an old listing in the catalog that hasn't been used for a long time. And it's a listing that has reviews or it had a great sales rank. And so you get one of these listings and you slowly change the details over time. So this week you change the picture and next week you change the title and then you change the bullet so you don't raise any flags. And all of a sudden it's your listing for your product instead of the zombie product. That from- sucks about true black hat right there. That oh not- yeah. Yeah, that does yeah. not sound like a good idea because guess what? Especially if people start teaching black hat ideas like that, guess what happens? Everybody starts doing it mm-hmm. and Amazon catches on. Oh, they do. And they've actually created some software to help them find this that they launched, I think, in December. Um, so they are going to be finding these listings more frequently. So the people who think they've gotten away with it, it's going to start coming back to bite them. But I know it's super tempting, but I, all of you have seen one of these. Everyone has bought a product where you're like, I'm buying pencils. Why does the review say this is a great lipstick? 
right? It, everyone's seen that before. Nope. It makes no sense. I, don't I never understood what it was. Mm -hmm. That makes a lot of sense now. Yep. That is exactly what it is. So Amazon takes listing errors and even things that you and I would see as minor mistakes or good faith mistakes. Um, they take those errors in the catalog a lot more seriously than we do. Uh, and, 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 that's part of why the enforcement really comes as a surprise to people when it happens. Also, and here's the scariest part of the entire thing to me, um, seller support gives wrong answers all the time. All the time. We, we say that they don't know their ass from their elbow half the time. And so you might you know. get everybody who calls is going to get a different response. Mm -hmm. And that's what makes it really challenging. And oftentimes if Amazon changes the policy, you can contact seller support and they're not going to be able to give you the right answer because they're not going to know what Amazon's doing. Exactly. And where this is most dangerous on listing suspensions that I've seen is where sellers have asked um, seller support to either break variations or to uh, combine ASIN detail pages um, or to, you know, so that there's different strategies and different reasons you would do these things, but it can always be against policy. You cannot put things together that do not match. If you have multiple product detail pages and you create them into a family where it's the parent and the child listings, the products really do have to be identical except for size, color, quantity. And then there are a few categories out there where there's some different thing. So like flavor, in grocery or scent for a lotion if it's the exact same but other than that the picture should be identical except for like the color changing and that's one thing that i see variations a lot of where i'm just like how are all of those on the same variation right um and it, it it's confusing to the buyer if mm -hmm. you have a halloween item a christmas item and a valentine's day item they're not the same item they're three mm -hmm. different items they're just different seasons, which makes no sense because season is not one of those things that is changeable. It's not an actual variation and people try right. and do that. You're exactly right. And season is not one character is not one. So you can't have the Sesame street one and then, you know, Elmo on this one and big bird on that one, big bird is not a color. And that is something that see you're laughing because you've seen it where someone will take what's essentially a style or other characteristic. And because it won't go into the variation, it's not allowed. They shoehorn it in by calling it a color. And so they'll call Elmo red and they'll call big bird, big bird yellow. Right. And so, <laughs> When you and mouse over. <laughs> this is what we're always talking about not doing, which is trying to get around the limitations that Amazon has put there for a reason. There are right. reasons Amazon puts limitations in place. They want to make it the best buying experience for their customer. Amazon is all about the customer. They're going to do what makes the most sense for the customer facing. And if that is making things more restrictive for us so that the catalog stays cleaner, then that's what they're going to do. It's a little annoying for us, but guess what? You just have to create multiple listings. It's not going to be a variation. Yes. Sometimes we want the variation. They'll see it all there. Right. Yeah. But there's a reason why Amazon has it set up the way that they do. And Amazon sees it purely as a bestseller rank ploy. They don't see it as I created these three bundles and I think people looking for bundle A are, are also maybe going to be interested in B and I want them to see my selection. Like it's a store shelf, you know, at Party City where you're picking between the different plates and cups for the kid's birthday party, right? You yep. see it that way. Amazon thinks that the reason you're bundling them together is so you'll get better bestseller rank and so the reviews will be combined. That's what they think. That's what they think because that's how they, that's how their business operates. Right. And so they look at it solely from a metric perspective and not mm -hmm. from how we're trying to help the buyer. Right. But in reality, it, it, if you put, let's say Elmo and PJ masks and mm -hmm. Paw Patrol all on one listing, that really doesn't make any sense. While yes, they're all toddler based characters. The kid <laughs> who likes Paw Patrol doesn't also like Sesame Street. Exactly. And, and Amazon, like it or not, they have to set some rules around this or it would just be an unholy mess. Can you even imagine what the catalog would look like? Oh, look at so, eBay. <laughs> yeah. 
<laughs> right, where the categories are just, I mean, my goodness, you can't drill down and do a category. And yeah, it's confusing for absolutely. And you have to put in different keywords over and over to find what you want. Amazon does not want that. And yeah. They want it to be easy for the buyer to find what it is they're looking for. And that's why they're putting in place the limitations they put in place for sellers so that their buyers can have the best experience. Right. Right. And then also important for people who bundle, um, and I know everyone's heard this, it's like a broken record, but it's something we have seen some recent suspensions for, is the idea of multi-packs having to be manufacturer multi-packs. So if you are putting together a multi-pack, you can't just say, oh, I'm going to do a quantity of seven <laughs> because you know that it's really sold in four and eight. And so you're trying to do something different. So you'll be able to compete on a listing. You can't do that. It has to be a manufacturer's original multi-pack quantity. Or if you have a relationship with a manufacturer, you can get permission from them to do a multi-pack quantity that's unique. Um, and, and that's totally fine. But but you can't just, you know, make up stuff because you want it anymore. That, that was cool while it lasted, though. Yeah, and it, it's, <laughs> I, I mean, I remember, like, Crystal Light, like the packets, mm -hmm. where there used to be two, seven, 13, like all these right. random numbers. I was like, did you just have a miscellaneous number that you bought off of a retail <laughs> shelf and just put them in a bundle because, or multi-pack because that's what you had? Like, I don't <laughs> understand why you did that. <laughs> <laughs> I had all these 20s and then I just had 13 left. So I just, <laughs> just going to throw them up there. Now that doesn't, so let's talk, that brings me into the RA realm a little bit. Mm -hmm. And can we talk a little bit about the dangers of retail arbitrage and what you're seeing in that space? Because I mean, that opens you up to a whole lot of things. Is Amazon accepting retail receipts anymore? They do. Um, and with pretty good consistency. We have had some that are rejected, and frankly, it doesn't really follow a great pattern. Um, the ones that I've seen rejected the most are Walmart online receipts. I think that they think those are all forged. Frankly, I've seen a lot that are forged, and I've had to go back to clients and say, you made this up, didn't you? We can't do that. Uh, but it's like, they, nope, we're not going to play the black hat game. We need your actual receipt. <laughs> that's right. Well, and be very aware that if you submit a forged docu document to Amazon and they figure it out, which they figure it out a lot more than you would think they would, they have a database that they run images against and they also call suppliers and they will find out if you submit a fake or manipulated document and then they block you for code of conduct for for forged and manipulated documents and it is very close to impossible to get your account back. So... so Basically, code of conduct is the, you don't want to land here. That is the kiss of death. Yes. Okay. <laughs> you so don't want to be there. Let's talk about that code of conduct. We've talked about mm -hmm. a couple of ways that you can land there. What are, what are some of the others that we need to be aware of, of not to fall there so we don't fall into code of conduct violations? So what we talked about before with the idea of circumventing. Um, anytime you're trying to go around an Amazon policy and they figure that out, that's code of conduct. So for example, for a long time, you can't sell vaping stuff on Amazon. You can't even sell chargers for vaping equipment on Amazon. And so people would put them, they'd create a listing and it would be all this nonsense. Like the title would be nonsense. Nothing would make sense. None of the words would say vaping. And I guess they'd throw ads out there somewhere and they'd sell a bunch of it. And then once they sold a certain amount, they'd take it down and they'd create a new listing with all this nonsense stuff, right? So they were circumventing to make sure they didn't get caught. That will get you a code of conduct. Um, <laughs> sometimes forged documents will get you a code of conduct. Um, some platform and bestseller rank manipulation. A lot of times they'll bust you for platform manipulation. You can come back from it, but if it's too obscene, they'll call it code of conduct. The zombie listings are code of conduct. And then um, anytime they think there's collusion going on, which this is really important for small sellers because I think a lot of us have buddies and our friends help us figure out how to do Amazon. So I'll give you an example. I have a guy who's a really successful supplement seller and he buys his supplements from a contract manufacturer here in the United States. And so some of his friends wanted to learn how to do this because my guy's really good at it. 
So he decided to do this little mini coaching program. So he got four of his friends and they each paid him like a thousand bucks and they did this little class. So he decided that the best way to do this was they would all just order the same supplement from his supplement contract manufacturer and have different branding put on the packaging for all four. So <laughs> they or they ordered it all on the same day, like they each placed orders the same day. All all the supplements, so there were five of them, all five of them hit the warehouse in pallets on the same day at Amazon. What's the, the likelihood of that happening? But wow. And, I know. And there and then the 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 kicker is that he got logins, administrative permissions to all of their accounts so he could help them set up their PPC ads and everything. So they all the accounts had a shared login email address. Now, were they really colluding? Actually, no, they weren't. No, because they were they were learning and they were setting different prices for their products. And then their goal was that they would each go out and order buy different kinds of supplements and different lines of products and all that jazz. But to Amazon, oh my goodness, how could they not think it was collusion? They suspended all of them. We got them all back, even though it was code of conduct, which I thought was nigh into a miracle. And I was actually really proud of us. because <laughs> it, was, it was so messy. Um, but you can see how when sellers are working together, trying to learn or doing group buys, you know, if you have all the same products in your inventory, it looks like collusion. If your pricing is all the same, it looks like collusion. And if you give your friends who are sellers, third-party access to your account, that can really look like collusion. So having a third-party access for a service provider, that's cool. Or for your virtual assistant, that's fine. All of that's good. But they are not other sellers. They're not competing with you and selling the same products. So no, no, don't, don't do any of that. Don't do that. We don't want code of conduct. We want nope. to stay in business. Um, so <laughs> now... Going back to the reinstating part, like code of conduct, mm -hmm. you're basically cut your own throat if you landed there. I mean, you've told us of a few options where you've gotten them back in, but yes. it's very, very hard to get there. Yes. Now, how often do people get reinstated? I mean, there's some that are basically, for me, it feels like a slap on the wrist. You're, you're out for a month or two and then you get your account back mm -hmm. where there's others that it takes even longer. So what does that look like? So it really depends on the type of suspension. So for example, an inauthentic suspension, used sold is new, our success rates are super high on those. And generally it takes, well, it depends on how slow Amazon is, which that's <laughs> like right now they're really slow because of all this COVID-19 stuff and that they suspended and warned all these people. So they're swamped. So right now seller performance is slow and then it'll speed up again and you know, it waxes and wanes. Generally speaking, inauthentic, you sold as new, couple of weeks, you're back, you're fine. Most of the time, if you're a good actor. Um, so things like platform manipulation, it depends. Have you been suspended for it once or twice? If you've been suspended once and you come clean and you admit everything you did, you can get reinstated most of the time. Second time around, oh my goodness, it's going to be really hard, close to impossible. Well, they you don't like just it. said you weren't going to do this again. And here right. we are catching you doing it again. Right. Well, and you know, what's funny. You can have two or three very successful reinstatements for you sold as new, inauthentic, other product quality, order defect rate, late shipping, all those things. You can get multiple bites at the apple if you do a good job on your second time around appeal, third time around appeal, but platform manipulation, uh-uh. One time, okay, second time, you're gone. And you may have seen that Amazon is currently working with the FTC on, the, on price gouging, and you can bet your boots that they are also talking a lot about platform manipulation and reviews. So it's about to get so much harder for anyone who's still playing games in that, in that area. Oh, we want that, right? We want the people who are playing games to get out of the way so that the people who are playing it, honestly, um, we aren't playing the game. We're just selling on a platform because um, right. it's not a game. It's a business. And I, I think that some people think that, oh, it's, this is just how I do business. Well, <laughs> racketeering is how some people do business and it's not okay. It's illegal. So looking at it from what can we do to make sure we're above board? What right. are some of the things that our clients can do to make sure that they're not landing in some of these situations. 
So like on platform manipulation, some of it, it's really basic stuff that people who are good people with good hearts think that it's not going to get them in trouble because they have good intentions. Um, we still see people who get suspended for platform manipulation because they have friends and family leave them reviews. And some of that really is totally innocent. I had one person whose mother-in-law got her, like all of her book club or something to review this, pro to buy and review a product that her um, kid's family had launched. And it, it was completely innocent. The intention was innocent, but to Amazon, it looked bad. Um, so they suspended. So you can't ask friends and family like you used to be able to, to even if they buy the product, even if they buy it, they still shouldn't leave you a re positive review because Amazon will perceive that in a different way than you intended. And it doesn't matter if you have the best product in the world and it's all honest. Amazon is not a human. Amazon is a robot. It doesn't have emotions. And I think that that's the part where we forget that we tend to, well, I didn't mean it that way. Well, right. Just because you didn't mean it that way, the robot doesn't recognize that. It, it knows this is how it's supposed to be, and this feels mm -hmm. like this, what it shouldn't be. And the department that handles all of these issues is seller performance, but they are under an umbrella called risk management. So we all think of them as seller performance. It's not. It is risk management. And risk management, you don't assume people are good actors. You assume you're looking for the bad actors. It's a completely different mindset. And Hence the shoot first, ask questions later mentality of Amazon. Well, and there are, okay, I can, I can sit here and tell you a hundred horror stories about Amazon treating people, treating sellers badly. I mean, I, I could talk for days about terrible situations where they over-enforced or wrongly enforced. However, we all have to remember what Amazon's viewpoint is. Amazon is a highly regulated company. They're becoming more highly regulated. So if you look at it from their perspective, you can start to kind of understand, like they have regulations they have to comply with about overseas ownership of accounts. They have to make sure that accounts are not being used for fraud purposes. Um, I'm sure you've all seen like on eBay, the, the Disney video thing where it's all money laundering, right? It's these Disney black videos, oh, the VHS tapes. They're worth $9,000. Man, that's all money laundering. That's the <laughs> worth that. That's a money laundering listing. There's money laundering going on on Amazon too. And they are required to find these things. There's counterfeit stuff on Amazon that if they don't find it, they're going to, they're facing possible new legislation that could really hurt their business. Um, platform manipulation, that's all the Federal Trade Commission coming after them. There, there's just an endless amount of potential regulation and enforcement that could be done against Amazon because of what third party sellers do. So when you look at it that way, you can be a little more sympathetic to why they have all these rules that frankly make our jobs a lot harder. As sellers. They make our jobs harder, but they allow a platform like Amazon to still exist. Right. And that's how we have to look at it. You know, we look at it from the small business mindset and Amazon looks at it from the big business mindset, which is a very right. different place. They're having to deal with challenges that we don't even have to deal with. There's no federal trade commission coming after me and the that's size right. of my business. I don't have to worry about that. But Amazon has different things that they have to worry about because of the kind of and size of business that they are. And mm -hmm. part of that is managing the people that they have brought on to sell on their platform and making sure that they're above bar so that Amazon doesn't get its throat slit because they had people that weren't in control. <laughs> exactly. And so talking about risk management, you brought up retail arbitrage, which I know is a big hot button topic. And there are people out there who will tell you, you should never do retail arbitrage. You shouldn't do it anymore. So let's talk a second about risk management because everyone's risk profile is different. Right. And so you have to decide based on what you know about Amazon, what your personal risk profile is. So it's, it's like I have friends who have a lot of personal debt and they're very comfortable with that. And then I know people who are comfortable with zero debt. Right. They cannot stand having a credit card balance. It'll put them over the edge. Yep. So Amazon, your seller account on Amazon is the exact same way. There are 
risky behaviors and less risky behaviors. So retail arbitrage, your biggest risk is IP complaints right now. And we've all seen all these massive influx of IP complaints. It's very frustrating. Um, the problem with those complaints is they're very hard to overcome. But some people do retail arbitrage all day long for months and months or years and hardly get any IP complaints and have no problems. So you have to decide personally, how much risk can I stand? Is it worth it because I source stuff with amazing margins and then if it comes to an end, I can get past that somehow. I can find another way or I can convince Amazon. Other people would say, oh my goodness, I cannot stand that risk. I'm never going to do retail arbitrage again. So it, it's really about you personally making that decision. And I think it goes to where are you in the size of your business and where are you in, in how that impacts your life. If your account were to get suspended for an IP claim, can you come back from that? Do you yes. have the ability to get reinstated or can you survive for three or six months while Amazon figures stuff out? If you can't, you're, you have to factor in your risk of, do I want to risk losing my account because I was doing RA? And so you have, like, as Leslie was saying, what is your risk tolerance? And I know this is something that Chris and I always talk about because I have a much lower risk tolerance than Kristen does when it comes to inventory sourcing. Um, I mean, we're both fully wholesale bundles at this point, but she'll buy more of something than I would have. But like everybody is different in how much they're willing to invest and how they're willing to invest in their business. Absolutely. And also setting money aside is so important. And something, I think a lot of people who got on Amazon when I did, which is a decade ago, the risks were so much lower. And so all you ever thought about was, I've got to pay my taxes on what I'm making on this. But then there were no other real expenses, right? If you're working out of your house, you're shipping everything to FBA. Um, what other risks, what other, not risks, what other fees, what other money do you need set aside to grow except to buy more inventory? Got to buy more inventory. I got to pay my taxes. That's it. Well, now you have to think about, I need some cash flow in case my account were to go down. And I have to make sure that I can pay people if I have people on staff. I have to make sure that I can pay my outstanding invoices if I have outstanding invoices. I might need money for a lawyer or a consultant um, because IP com complaints, sometimes you get a lawyer to write a mean letter that will help or you hire a service like mine and we help write mean letters. Um, sometimes with IP complaints, it does take a lawyer and a consultant, unfortunately. So there's actually a reason now with all the enforcement at Amazon to say, I need to set aside this much money in case I go down, I need expenses to live, I've got someone to pay, especially if it's a relative who works for you. And then, you know, to help me get back up, how can I get back up? Yeah, so these are some of the ramifications that can happen if your account goes down. If you're making $500 a month, it's a very different thing than if you're making six figures a month. You're in a different place, but the, you still need to be able to go, how will this impact me? Now we've talked about the financial ramifications. There's also the emotional ramifications of getting your account suspended. I'm sure that you see that with some of your clients because every time that I, when we hear it in the Facebook groups, it's always, oh my gosh, I got shut down. I don't know what to do. And they just like, mm -hmm. I picture people saying their hand flapping. I don't know why, but like, they're just like, or rumple still skin. Like I'm freaking out. Like, I don't know what to do. My head is <laughs> steaming is coming out of my ears, right? Yes. Amazon is evil. I did nothing wrong and all of that. So there's the emotional piece. Can you speak to that a little bit? Oh my goodness. Yes. Um, a lot of our clients, especially if you're a smaller to mid-sized seller, selling on Amazon in some ways can be kind of I don't know. It's like you're alone sometimes. That's why Facebook groups exist and groups like yours exist and are so valuable because it's isolating. Like how many neighbors and friends, you, you know, you probably know a few people who are teachers and a few people who are in the healthcare professions, but how many sellers do you know organically in your life? Not from some Facebook group, but organically, hardly any. And a lot of times if you tell someone you're suspended, they automatically assume that you did something bad. Now, a lot of our clients did something wrong, but it wasn't malicious or terrible, or they made a mistake. None of those carry the kind of negative um, judgment that people get, like they shouldn't carry this negative judgment, but people are like, oh, you got suspended from Amazon. Like you must be a really bad person. If they don't understand 
how it works and that it, it, you know, there are good actors who are suspended all the time. So there's some shame and there's some embarrassment. And then the worry about future income. I have people call me and say, I can't pay my mortgage. I had to fire my brother. Um, I had to fire 20 people. I had to lay off my staff. Um, I've had grown men who are strangers to me cry on the phone. Um, right now I've got a very large client suspended who has several hundred employees. We literally talk every hour um, because he is, that's where he is. Um, he's got a great company. They're going to get reinstated, but the time waiting is very upsetting. Um, so I think the more, you know, I, I have something I tell clients all the time, control what you can control, especially when you're selling on Amazon. There's so many variables you can't control. So you have to control what you can. You have to turn off the setting for refurbishment. You can't commingle your inventory. These are things you can control. Another thing you can control is having a pile of cash, you know, setting aside $10,000 or $5,000 or $100,000, depending on your business size, so that if something happens, you're not worrying about the money part. You're worrying about how to fix the issue, how to write a great plan of action, how to escalate to the right executive and get reinstated. Because if all you're worrying about is my lights are going to go out tomorrow, how can you think clearly? So if you control what you can, if something bad ever happens, it's going to be a lot less stressful. And also just knowing you have that emergency fund there um, will, will make you more peaceful right now because if you get suspended you know that well at least my lights are going to be on and I can feed my children feed my children I can hire the consultant and the lawyer that I need to be able to actually help me right you know, get through this piece that I'm having to deal with and it's true because every piece of that stacks on top of it and makes it a lot harder to process what's going on. And it we want in business to be able to have that clear mindset. So often as entrepreneurs, business and life are kind of linked. And because mm -hmm. of that, we have to have those things in place to protect the life piece from the business piece. They are they are linked even though we don't want them to be fully, but they are. And so being able to have those supports in place to say, I can, if this happens, deal with this. Um, and, exactly. and so that it's important as I whack things over here. <laughs> Alrighty. So we have talked about so much information. My head is exploding. Leslie, you are a wealth of information <laughs> in this world. How can people, if they need your services or they want to learn more about what they can do to prevent this from happening to them? Where can they learn more about you, Riverbend Consulting, and all of that? We have a great website that is riverbendconsulting.com, and there's a great contact button at the top right. If anyone has immediate questions, uh, you can call us directly. We have people who do answer the phone all day long. Um, you can also reach me at leslie, L-E-S-L-E-Y, at riverbendconsulting.com. I'm happy to answer any questions at all. And you can find us on Facebook as well. And please uh, feel free to add me as a connection on LinkedIn. Um, and it's Leslie Hensel, H-E-N-S-E-L-L. -L. So I love having Amazon connections. I love Amazon sellers. They're just my favorite people in the world. Small businesses are so fun. They are so much fun. Um, it's a different dynamic than corporate. Um, and so there's a different, there's different needs, there's different concerns. Um, and it's a great community environment. Now this is an important piece guys, because I know the feeling I get sometimes I'm like, I'm sitting here in my office by myself and nobody cares. Like right. this is why having communities to join and be a part of and have people to ask questions of is important. Oh, guess what? If you head over to mommyincome.com slash join us, you can join our community. Use the code word prevent to get you in the door. Bring your questions, share your wins, share your stuck points. We want to be able to help you grow your business. Thank you, Leslie, so much for your time. This has been hugely, hugely informative. And we'll see you guys same time, same place next week. Mm -hmm.